Top 10, top I got a top 10, 10. Top 10. Got my motivation high for my top 10, my top 10. Gotta learn from the wise women and men Need motivation? Watch Top 10 with Believe Nation. Hey, it's Evan Carmichael, and this channel was created to help you overcome the number one challenge that is holding you back, a lack of belief in yourself. You watch these videos because you know there's something greater inside you as well. You've got Michael Jordan level talent at something. So get ready to have no regrets, follow your heart, and learn how to build a great business like Jeff Bezos in my take on his top 50 rules for success to give you the belief that you need. Okay, let's kick it off with rule number one, have no regrets. When I decided to do this, I, I first talked to my, my wife who is sitting here in the audience and uh, she had married a, uh, a you know, relatively stable, goofy, but still relatively stable uh, person working at a Wall Street firm. I worked at a quantitative hedge fund and uh, this was a hard decision. And I, I was looking for the right framework in which to make that kind of important decision. And, 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 and the right framework I found is a regret minimization framework. And I, so that's just a nerdy way of saying that you wanna project yourself to age 80 and then think back over your life. And, and if, you're, if, you're, if you're 80, what are the, th you wanna minimize the number of regrets you have throughout that period of time. I think this is something a lot of people do uh, maybe uh, subconsciously, they probably, very few people probably name it regret minimization framework because most people are healthier than that. <laughs> but, but it was uh, a very clear way for me to think about making that kind of life decision. Uh, and, the, and, and, and the way it helped was I, I thought, okay, if I go do this thing and participate in this thing called the internet that I genuinely believe is going to be a big deal, and if I fail, Am I going to regret having tried and failed? And I knew the answer to that was no. But I also knew that if I didn't try, that I would always regret that. I would always wonder and it would haunt me uh, in, until that you know, mythical day, which I actually hope will come. Rule number two, follow your heart, not your head. Many, many kids and many grown-ups do figure out uh, over time what their passions are. And sometimes we let our, I don't think it's that hard. I think what happens though sometimes is that we let our intellectual selves overrule those passions. Uh, and so that's what needs to be guarded against. Rule number three, invest more in the product than in marketing. I'm gonna put the vast majority of my energy, attention, and dollars into building a great product or service and put a smaller amount into shouting about it, marketing it. Because I know if I build a great product or service, my customers will tell each other. You have to mix in some patience with that. Rule number four, pick a good name. Almost uh, seven years ago now, uh, I started this most incredible journey called Amazon.com. Actually at that time, it wasn't even called Amazon.com. It was called Cadabra Inc, as in Abracadabra. That was the original name of the company. And I had phoned uh, a lawyer on the way to Seattle from a cell phone. And uh, he said, well, what do you, to incorporate the company. He said, what do you want the company to be called? And I said, Cadabra. And he said, Cadaver? And I knew that was a bad name. Um, we changed it a few months later. Also, if you want to have more confidence, check out my 254 series. It's free. The link to join is in the description below. The stress primarily comes from not taking action if you absolutely can't tolerate critics, then don't do anything new or interesting. If everything has to work in two to three years, then that limits what you can do. Rule number five, stand for something. What we have always wanted to do is raise the standard for what it means to be customer centric to such a degree that other organizations, whether they be other companies or whether they be hospitals or government agencies, whatever the organization is, they should look at Amazon as a role model and say, how can we be as customer centric as Amazon? Even if competitors, could, I imagine, right? Uh, I, hopefully competitors as well. But if we could make, you know, uh, uh, if, if that could be our legacy, that we kind of raise the general idea 
of what it means to be customer centric, that would be a huge accomplishment. It would be accomplishing a mission that's much bigger than ourselves. Rule number six, focus on the customer. We know customers like low prices. We know customers like big selection. And we know that customers like fast delivery. And those things are going to be true 10 years from now. They're going to be true 20 years from now. So we can count on those things and we can put energy into them. We know customers like their products fast. And so we work on things that we know customers like. What has worked at Amazon is focusing on the customer, being very cu putting the customer first, which is easy to say but difficult to do. And if you really are customer centric, it's like being the host of a party. You're holding the party for your guests. Uh, sometimes the host of the party is holding the party for the host of the party. <laughs> and that's, that leads to a different kind of party. Rule number seven, focus on your passion. My advice would be the same for uh, any kind of entrepreneur. And that is make sure that you are focused on something you're passionate about. So if you look at the early internet companies, they were started and focused on doing something that they thought was very interesting long before the internet was fashionable in any way. Um, you know, I, I, you know, we are currently an underdog once again. We've been in business for six years and there was exactly one year where we were not the underdog and that was 1999. I like the, the underdog years because it makes, uh, you know, I liked it when all the people we hired, their parents told them they were crazy. Like that was the, that was kind of the good era. Fortunately, it's back. Um, in 1999, all the parents were like, you know, giving their brothers and sisters high fives. You know, my son is working at amazon.com. So that's a very, uh, you can't follow the fashion when you're trying to do a startup company or I think really anything in life. But you have to, as an entrepreneur, if you're gonna, if you're gonna build a company, pick something you think is interesting has the intersection of genuinely creating real customer value and then just stay right there and let the wave catch you. Rule number eight, build a culture. So you can hold a ballet and that can be successful. And you can hold a rock concert and that can be successful. Just don't hold a ballet and advertise it as a rock concert. And so you need to be clear uh, with all of your uh, stakeholders with, you know, are you holding a ballet or are you holding a rock concert? And then people get to self-select in. You know, we hire uh, people who are, who are really motivated by building new customer experiences. They like to pioneer, they like the rate of change, uh, they, uh, they wake up in the shower motivated by thinking about customers. And occasionally somebody joins Amazon who their primary motivation comes from being, uh, thinking about competition or competitors. And those people can find Amazon a little dull. Um, you know, so, and it, again, it's not about right or wrong. It's just that different people are motivated by different things. And what happens with corporate cultures is that over time, uh, the, you, uh, people collect themselves in, in, a, in a way where they like that culture and then it becomes self-sustaining. Rule number nine, sell premium products at non-premium prices. One of the things you've done so well at Amazon is you've undercut all of your rivals by keeping the prices low. Does that same strategy apply to tablets? Yes, our approach is premium products at non-premium prices. So we sell the hardware at break even. So we don't try to make any money when we sell this hardware. And we hope to make money when people use the devices, not when they buy the devices. And so that's a very different approach from uh, most companies. Most companies are building quite a bit of profit into the sale of these devices. Rule number 10, take a risk. Whatever it is that you want to do, you're, there's going to be risk in your life. And risk is a necessary component of progress. You can make any pioneering movements in the world of any kind, whether they be the geographical, physical exploration that I've just been talking about, or whether it be uh, you know, a more cerebral exploration of a scientific field, or I bet you could ask that question of every speaker here, and I bet that every speaker here has taken substantial risks, uh, whether it be intellectual or otherwise, to achieve what, they're, you know, what they've done. Rule number 11, take bold bets. My job, one of my jobs as the leader of Amazon is to encourage people to be bold. And people love to focus on things that aren't yet working. Um, and that's good, it's human nature. That kind of divine discontent can be very helpful. But 
uh, you really, you know, it's incredibly hard to get people to take bold bets, and you need to encourage that. And if you're going to take bold bets, they're going to be experiments. And if they're experiments, you don't know ahead of time whether they're going to work. Uh, experiments uh, are, by their very nature, uh, prone to failure. But big successes, a few big successes, compensate for dozens and dozens of things that didn't work. So, you know, bold bets, AWS, Kindle, Amazon Prime, our third-party seller business, all of those things are examples of bold bets that, uh, that, that did work, and they pay for a lot of experiments. I've made billions of dollars of failures at Amazon.com, literally billions of dollars of failures. And, uh, uh, you know, you might remember Pets.com or Cosmo or, you know, you know, give myself a root canal with no anesthesia very easily. Uh, none of those things are fun, but they, but they also, they don't matter. What really matters is companies that don't continue to experiment, companies that don't embrace failure, they eventually get in the desperate position where they, the only thing they can do is make a kind of Hail Mary bet at the very end of their corporate existence. Whereas companies that are, you know, uh, making bets all along, even, you know, big bets, but not bet the company bets. I don't, I don't believe in bet the company bets. That's when you're desperate. That's, that's the last thing you can do. Rule number 12, step ferociously. We know from our past experiences that big things start small. Uh, you know, it, it, the biggest oak starts from an acorn, and you've got to recognize, if you want to do anything new, you've got to be willing to let that acorn grow into a little sapling and then finally into a small tree, and maybe one day it'll be a big business on its own. And in fact, that's one of the um, mottos for one of your initiatives, and forgive my, my pronunciation of the Latin, but Greta Team Ferocite, what does that mean to you? Well, it, it means step-by-step uh, -step ferociously and it's the motto for Blue Origin. Um, and uh, uh, basically, you can't skip steps. You have to put one foot in front of the other. Things take time. Uh, you, there are no shortcuts. And, uh, but, uh, but you want to do those steps with you know, passion and ferocity. Rule number 13, earn a good reputation. I think probably our most important piece of intellectual property is our brand name. And I think people, and, and, and I think this is very important for anybody who's going to start a company or, or, or market an invention to understand, is that brands for companies are like reputations for people. And reputations are hard-earned and easily lost. So the most important intellectual property that a company can have is, for us, it's, that, it's, it's, it's Amazon. It's the, that name, but what it stands for. And we've worked very hard to earn trust. You can't ask for trust. You just have to do it the hard way, one step at a time. You, you make a promise and then fulfill the promise. You say, we'll deliver this to you, uh, you know, tomorrow, and then you actually deliver it tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> what and if you do that over and over again, then it ultimately you can instill your company's name with a reputation. And that's, I think, you know, sometimes people talk about brands in this very amorphous way, but for me, I, I like to think of it as a person, and what is the reputation that that person has, and how have they earned that reputation? Rule number 14, take action. I think stress, you can be, uh, I think one of the things that's very important to note about stress is that stress primarily comes from not taking action over something that you can have some control over. So if I find that some particular thing is causing me to have stress, that's a, uh, a, a warning flag for me. What it means is there's something that I haven't completely identified, perhaps in my conscious mind, that is bothering me, and I haven't yet taken any action on it. I find as soon as I identify it and make the first phone call or send off the first email message or whatever it is that we're going to do to start to address that situation, even if it's not solved, the mere fact that we're addressing it dramatically reduces any stress that might come from it. So stress comes from ignoring things that you shouldn't be ignoring, um, I think in large part. So uh, stress doesn't come, people get stress uh, uh, wrong all the time, in my opinion. Stress doesn't come from hard work, for example. You know, you can be working incredibly hard and loving it. And likewise, you can be out of work 
and incredibly stressed over that. So, and likewise, if you kind of use the, you know, use that as an analogy for what I was just talking about, if you're out of work, but you're going through, you know, a disciplined uh, approach of, you know, a series of job interviews and so on and working to remedy that situation, you're going to be a lot less stressed than if you're just worrying about it and doing nothing. Rule number 15, find work-life harmony. If you're giving great customer experience, um, there's the only way to do that is with happy people. You can't do it with a set of miserable people, um, you know, watching the clock all day. So does that include work-life balance and all those things? Yes, but I would. I use. I teach um, three uh, leadership classes a year at Amazon. I'm a part of it. They're bigger classes, but I come in and teach a session. And I always talk about work-life balance, except I like to use the phrase work-life harmony rather than balance, because to me, balance implies a strict trade, whereas I find that when I am happy at work, I come home more energized, I'm a better husband, a better dad, and when I'm happy at home, I come in and better boss and better colleague. And so that, that um, it's not, you could be out of work and be, have terrible work-life balance. You know, even though you've got all the time in the world, you, right. you could just feel like, oh my God, you know, I'm miserable and you would be draining energy. And so you have to find that harmony. It's a much better word. And I think for most people, it's about meaning. People want to know that they're doing something interesting and useful. And for us, you know, because of the challenges that we have chosen for ourselves, uh, we get to work in the future. And it's super fun to work in the future for the right kind of person. Rule number 16, execute your idea. It's easy to have ideas. It's very hard to turn an idea into a successful product. There are a lot of steps in between and it takes persistence, relentlessness, so I always tell people who are, you know, who think they want to be entrepreneurs, it's, you need a combination of stubborn relentlessness and flexibility. And you have to know when to be which. And basically you need to be stubborn on your vision because otherwise it'll be too easy to give up. But you need to be very flexible on the details. Because as you go along pursuing your vision, you'll find that some of your preconceptions were wrong. And you're going to need to be able to change those things. So I think uh, taking an idea successfully all the way to the market and turning it into a real product that people care about and that really improves people's lives is a lot of hard work. Rule number 17, have role models. I had some family role models and I had some other people, um, you know, some sort of historical role models that I really looked at too. So certainly my, my uh, uh, grandfather was a serious role model for me. I just had spent so much time. I think you learn different things from grandparents than you learn from parents. It's a, it's a great, I would encourage anybody to try to spend time not only with their parents, but with their grandparents. Um, and, uh, but I, and I also had... Uh, uh, I, two people I always would read about and uh, uh, were Thomas Edison and Walt Disney. Those were sort of my two, you know, biographical heroes. <laughs> <laughs> I've always been interested in, in inventors and invention, and Edison, of course, just you know, for for uh, a, a little kid is the, and probably for adults too. I still feel this way, at least is the, not only the symbol of that, but the actual fact of that, the just incredible inventor. Um, and, uh, and I've always felt that there's a certain kind of uh, important pioneering that goes on from an inventor like Thomas Edison. And then Disney was a different sort of thing. He also, you know, a real pioneer and an inventor and doing new things. But it seemed to me that he had this incredible capability to... Uh, create a vision that he could get a large number of people to share because the, the things that Disney invented like Disneyland, you know, the, the theme parks and so on, they were such big visions that no single individual, unlike a lot of the things that Edison worked on, no single individual could ever pull them off. Um, and, uh, and Walt Disney really was able to get a big team of people working in a concerted direction. Rule number 18, do what you love. 
I don't really remember the exact day or anything, but when I was in college is when I started thinking about wanting to be uh, an entrepreneur someday. So it was, I was not the kid with the lemonade stand. You know, I didn't, I wasn't one of these kids who was always trying to race. I always wanted to be a scientist when I was little, uh, but I'd also always loved computers. I like, I was lucky because at my age this is unusual to have uh, access to a mainframe computer from my elementary school when I was in fourth grade and uh, quickly learned that the, the, there was a pre-programmed Star Trek game on that computer and then I never did anything except play Star Trek with the computer. So I don't know how formative that was. It certainly led, it certainly helped my Star Trek knowledge considerably. <laughs> and, and, but I've always loved computers. Somewhere in college I started watching some of the people who were like setting up, you know, college pizza delivery services and, you know, the kind of the core entrepreneurs and thinking, you know, this looks like a really fun thing to do. Rule number 19, be a team player. I think it's the very rare idea that can be done by a single individual. Almost everything that is going to uh, change the world, solve a problem, improve something, these are usually big efforts and they require, uh, you know, teams, a team working together to really get something important done. And that has been the story of Amazon.com. At every step along the way, we've had a team here uh, that is uh, is making this work. I mean, it, it, I don't know. Even even at the smallest scale, you have to figure out how to get help from your friends, from your family members, uh, from uh, people that you can hire in those early days. I think without that, it would never work. Rule number 20, think long term. Do something you're very passionate about. And don't try to chase what is kind of the hot passion of the day. I think we actually saw this. I think you see it all over the place in many different contexts. But I think we saw it uh, in the internet world quite a bit, where you know at the sort of peak of the uh, sort of internet uh, you know mania in say 1999, you found people who were uh, you know very passionate about something. They kind of left that job. And decided I'm going to, you know, do something in the internet because it's, you know, it was almost like the, you know, the 1849 gold rush in a way. I mean, you find that people, uh, if you go back and study the history of the 1849 gold rush, you find that, you know, uh, at that time everybody who was in was within the shouting distance of California was, you know, they might have been a doctor, but they quit being a doctor and they started panning for gold. <laughs> <laughs> and that, that almost never works. Um, and even if it does work, uh, you know, according to some metric, financial success or whatever it might be, I suspect it leaves you ultimately unsatisfied. So you really need to be very clear with yourself. And I think one of the best ways to do that is this notion of projecting yourself forward to age 80, looking back on your life and trying to make sure you've minimized the number of regrets you have. That works for that works for career decisions. It works for family decisions. Um, you know, do you want? I, I have a, a 14 month old son, and it's very easy for me to, if I think about myself when I'm 80, I know I want to watch that little guy grow up. Um, and so it, it's, I don't want to be 80 and think, shoot, you know, I, I missed that whole thing, and I don't have the kind of relationship with my son that I wished I had, and so on and so on. So if you think about that, so I, I guess another thing that I would recommend to people is that they always take a long-term point of view. And I think this is something about which there's a lot of uh, controversy. You know, there's a, uh, there's a, you know some, a lot of people, and I'm just not one of them, believe that you should live for the now. I think what you do is you think about the, 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 the great expanse of time ahead of you and try to make sure that you're planning for that in a way that's going to leave you ultimately satisfied. Um, so this is just my... This is the way it works for me, and I mean, this is everybody needs to find that for themselves. Um, uh, so I think there are a lot of paths to satisfaction, and you need to find one that works works for you. Rule number twenty-one: experiment more. You cannot invent and pioneer if you cannot accept failure. Ex you, to, to, to invent, you need to experiment, and if it's if you know in advance that it's going to work. It is not an experiment. And so that's a very important thing. You, you know, it's a, the, they are inseparable twins, failure and invention. And so you have to be willing to do that. And it's embarrassing to fail. Um, it, you know, it's always embarrassing to fail. But you have to say, no, that's not how this works. If I said to you, 
you have a 10% chance of a, a, with a particular decision, a 10% chance of a 100x return. You should take that bet every time, but you're still gonna be wrong nine out of 10 times, and it's gonna feel bad nine out of 10 times. And in, 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 with technology, the outcomes, the results can be very long-tailed. The, the payoff is, can be very asymmetric, which is why you should do so much experimentation. You know, pe everybody knows that if you swing for the fences, you hit more home runs, but you also strike out more. But with the baseball, that analogy doesn't go far enough because with baseball, no matter how well you connect with the ball, you can only get four runs. The success is capped at four runs. But in business, every once in a while, you step up to the plate and you hit the ball so hard, you get a thousand runs. And so when, that, when you have that kind of asymmetric payoff and you know, one, at, one at back can get you a thousand runs, it encourages you to experiment more. It's the right business decision to experiment more. It's also better for your customers. Customers like um, the successful experiments. Rule number 22, choose to do hard things. We all have adversity in our lives. You, I, 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 would, I, would, I doubt if you really, you know, if you know somebody, any friend or anybody that you talk to, um, uh, there's no lack of adversity. And, the, uh, and by the way, that's good because it's what teaches us how to get back up. You fall down, you get back up. It always happens. And uh, you, know, you get certain um, gifts in life and you want to take advantage of those. Um, uh, but you, I guess my advice on adversity and uh, success would be to be proud not of your gifts, but of your hard work and your choices. So, you know, you may be, the kinds of gifts you get in life, you know, you might be really good at math. It might be really easy for you. That's a kind of gift. Um, but practicing that math and taking it to the next step, that could be very challenging and hard um, and take a lot of sweat. That's a choice. You can't really be proud of your gifts because they were given to you. Um, you can be grateful for them and thankful for them. Um, and, but your choices, you choose to work hard. Um, you choose to do hard things. Those are choices that you can be proud of. Rule number 23, be an inventor. If you want to be an inventor of any kind, inventing a new, you know, a new service offering for customers or a new product or anything, the, being an inventor requires, because the world is so complicated, you have to be a domain expert. I mean, in a way, even if, even if you're not at the beginning, you have to learn, 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 learn enough so that you become a domain expert. But the danger is once you've become a domain expert, you can be trapped by that knowledge. And so inventors have this paradoxical ability to have that you know, 10,000 hours of practice and be a real domain expert and have that beginner's mind. Have that, that look at it freshly even though they know so much about the domain. And that's the key. Um, to, to inventing, you, you have to have both. And I think that is intentional. I think all of us have that inside of us and we can all do it, but you have to be intentional about it. You have to say, yeah, I am gonna become an expert and I'm gonna keep my beginner's mind. Rule number 24, go step by step. So your question is, you know, did I kind of anticipate what would happen over the last 22 years at Amazon? And the answer is God, no. So, you know, Amazon started as a very small company um, it was me and a few other people. I was driving all the packages to the post office myself in my 1987 Chevy Blazer. Um, and uh, when I raised money for Amazon, I had to raise a million dollars, which I raised from 22 different investors, $50,000 each. They got 20% of the company for, uh, for the million dollars. And um, uh, it was a... 40 people told me no, so I had to take 60 meetings to get 20 yeses. The first question was always, what's the internet? And I had to walk through that. And this was 1994, early 95. And so did I anticipate, you know, fast forward to today and, and the current version of it? No. It has been one foot in front of the other. And I think that that is true for most businesses. Um, where you kind of proceed adaptively, it's step by step, you, you figure it out, you have a success, 
And then you kind of double down on that success and you figure out what, what else you can do, what customers want. Rule number 25, find your calling. Ever since I was five years old, that's when Neil Armstrong stepped onto the surface of the moon. I've been um, kind of passionate about space, rockets, rocket engines, space travel. I became a science fiction reader. Um, and I've always known that I wanted to uh, um, you know, do something having to do with space. And I've spent a lot of time thinking about it for really almost my whole life. And that's one of the things you guys will find that you have passions. And having a passion is a gift. I think we all have passions. And you don't get to uh, choose them. They pick you. But you have to be alert to them. You have to be looking for them. And when you find your passion, it's a fantastic gift for you because it gives you direction. It gives you purpose. Uh, you can have a job, or you can have a career, or you can have a calling. And the best thing is to have a calling. And if you find your passion, you'll have that. And all your work won't feel like work to you. Rule number 26, be nimble and robust. The thing for companies is you need to be um, if you, uh, nimble and robust. So you need to be able to take a punch, uh, and you also need to be quick and, 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 and innovative and, and doing new things at a high speed. That's, that's the best defense against the future. And you have to always be leaning into the future. If you're, if you're leaning away from the future, the future is going to win every time. Never, ever, ever lean away from the future. Rule number 27, be long-term oriented. I uh, ask everybody to not think in two to three year time frames, but to think in five to seven year time frames. To not think about, when somebody says to me, congratulates Amazon on a good quarter, um, which is a very common thing to say. You meet somebody, they're being nice. They looked at your financial results for the quarter, they're like, good quarter. I say thank you, but what I'm thinking to myself is that quarter, all that, those quarterly results were actually pretty much fully baked about three years ago. And so like today, I'm working on you know, uh, a quarter that is gonna happen in 2020, not next quarter. Next quarter, uh, for all practical purposes, is done already, and it's probably been done for a couple of years. Um, and so if you start to think that way, um, it changes how you spend your time, how you plan, um, where you put your energy, um, and, and your ability to look around corners gets better. So many things improve if you can take a long term. And by the way, it's not natural for humans. So it's a, it's a discipline that you have to build. The, um, the kind of, you know, uh, get rich slowly schemes are not big sellers on uh, infomercials. You know, it's, uh, and so that's something that you have to sort of steal yourself for and discipline and teach um, uh, over time. Rule number 28, choose a life of adventure. You can choose. We all get to choose our life stories. And um, it's the choices that define us, not our gifts. Everybody in this room has many gifts. Um, I have many gifts. You can never be proud of your gifts because they're gifts. They were given to you. You might be you know, tall, uh, or you might be really good at math, or you might be extremely beautiful or handsome, or, you know, there, or, there are many gifts. And you can only be proud, really, of your choices, because those are the things that you are, that you're, that you are acting on. And one of the most important choices that each of us has, and you know this just as well as I do, is um, you can choose a life of ease and comfort, or you can choose a life of service and adventure. And when you're 80, which one of those things do you think you're going to be more proud of? You're going to be more proud of having chosen a life of service and adventure. Rule number 29, find allies. What motivates me when times are rough? Um, you know, I find if I'm stressed about something, it's usually because I'm not doing anything about it. And so if I'm stressed about something, I'm trying to figure out, why am I stressed? I'm listening to my body as a signal that, I'm, that something is uh, awry. And then I find that the stress goes away the second I take the first step of you know, identify the source of the stress. Why am I stressed about this? What's going on? And then you know, talk to somebody about it. Find, you know, find allies. Um, it, you know, I would say that uh, uh, if you can find um, friends uh, who are interested in similar things or want to help you solve a problem, problem solving is um, 
is inspiring for me all by itself. I have, as long as I have allies, there's nothing more fun than getting in a room with a group of uh, inventors and saying, look, here's the problem. Let's invent a solution to it. And as soon as you start doing that, I find that it turns from uh, something that might create stress into something that creates fun. Rule number 30, empower people. On the internet today, you know, two kids in their dorm room can reinvent an industry. That's how, how, uh, how it could, because you don't, you, the heavy lifting infrastructure is in place for that. Today, two kids in their dorm room can't do anything interesting in space. You know, you could build a CubeSat. There's not that much interesting about CubeSats. <laughs> and the, um, it'll, it, that may change, but right now, there's just, you, you need, there, there are certain laws of physics and certain things you need size for and th things need to be big. We need to be able to put big things in space at low cost. And so if I'm 80 years old and I can say to myself that Blue Origin did the heavy lifting, you know, I'm using my Amazon winnings mm -hmm. to do a new piece of heavy lifting infrastructure, um, uh, uh, which is low cost access to space. The vehicles have to be reusable. You can't throw them away. Throw away space vehicles every time, you're never going to lower the cost. So we're trying to lower the price of admission into space so that thousands of entrepreneurs can then do amazing, surprising things. Nobody in 1995... So that much. Just nobody in 95 predicted battle. Snapchat. Right. You know, it's like, I can't predict for you what amazing entrepreneurs, brilliant, amazing entrepreneurs will do in space. But I know if I give them low-cost access to space, some brilliant, you know... 22-year-old is going to figure it out. It's one of those things about what companies get sustainable. It's those that provide platforms upon which others can build. If you, Amazon if does you empower it, does others, it, you. empower others to do things. So, so AWS is like that. Yeah. Kindle Direct Publishing is like that. Our third-party selling business is like that. Fulfillment by Amazon is like that. Every time you figure out some way of providing tools and services that empower other people to deploy their creativity, you're really on to something. Rule number 31, focus on your customers. The secret sauce of Amazon, where there are several principles at Amazon, but the number one thing that has made us successful by far is obsessive compulsive focus on the customer as opposed to obsession over the competitor. And I talk so often to um, other CEOs and uh, some other CEOs and also founders and entrepreneurs and I can tell that even though they're talking about customers, they're really focusing on competitors. And it is a huge advantage to any company if you can stay focused on your customer instead of your competitor. Rule number 32, be resourceful. I spent an unusual amount of time with my uh, grandparents and especially with my grandfather on the ranch. So he had a ranch in South Texas and I would spend my summers there from age four to 16. And they, when I was four, they were taking me for the summer to kind of give my parents a break, you know, sort of because they were so young um, and it was useful. I was a handful, I'm sure. And, uh, and anyway, he, 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 he created the illusion for me when I was four years old that I was helping him on the ranch which of course could not have been true, but I believed it. And, um, and then as, by the time I was 16, of course, I was actually helping on the ranch. I, you know, I, could, I can fix prolapsed cattle. I can, you know, we did all of our own veterinary work. Some of the cattle even survived. Um, <laughs> and uh, we fixed windmills and laid you know, water pipelines and built fences and barns and fixed, that, fixed the bulldozer that you guys talked about. And so one of the things that's so interesting about that lifestyle and about my grandfather is he did everything himself. You know, he didn't call a vet if one of the animals was sick. He figured out what to do himself. And uh, So what does it mean? No delegation? Being resourceful, I think, mm -hmm. is the, you know, that you can always, you can't, if there's a problem, there's a solution. Mm -hmm. And of course, as you as you mature and, and get into the business world and anything you do on a team, you very quickly realize that it's not about just your own resourcefulness, it's about mm. team resourcefulness and how does that work. And Rule number 33, love what you do. I have this great luxury, I love my job, I tap dance into work. Even I, get back, I just got back from an amazing vacation in Norway 
Um, I got to go dog sledding and go to a wolf preserve and all this really cool stuff. But I couldn't wait to get back to work because it's so fun. And the reason, one of the reasons it's fun for me is I get to work in the future. So my job, I'm, I'm, I have very um, uh, limited kind of day-to-day -day operational uh, needs. That, you know, I'm, I've constructed my job so that I don't have to be pulled into the present. I can stay two or three years in the future. Rule number 34, start small. Everything I've ever done has started small. Um, Amazon started <laughs> with a couple of people and um, uh, Blue Origin started with five people and uh, the budget at Blue Origin was very, very small. Now the budget at Blue Origin is, approaches a billion dollars a year. And next year it'll be more than a billion dollars. And Amazon, it literally was 10 people. Today it's half a million people, but you, you, it's hard to remember for you guys, but for me it's like yesterday, I was driving the packages to the post office myself and um, hoping one day we could afford a forklift. And so, so for me, I've seen small things get big and it's part of this day one mentality. I like treating things as if, if they're small. You know, Amazon, even though it is a large company, I wanted to have the heart and spirit of a small one. Rule number 35, learn how to deal with critics. My approach to criticism and what I teach and preach inside Amazon is when you're criticized, first look in a mirror mm -hmm. and decide, are your critics right? Mm -hmm. If they're right, change. There are two kinds of critics. Uh, there are well-meaning critics um, who, uh, you know, they, they're worried it's not gonna work, but they do want it to work. And so it could be, I can give you an example, customer reviews would be one of those. Um, when we first did customer reviews 20 years ago, publishers were, some book publishers were not happy about it because some of them are negative. And so it was a very controversial practice at that time, but we thought it was right, and so we stuck to our guns and, 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 and had a deep keel on that and didn't, didn't, didn't change. Um, but, uh, there's a second kind of critic, which is the self-interested critic, mm. and they come in all shapes and sizes. You know, they're, um, so they can be any kind of institution, competitors, um, of course. And so when you are doing something in a new way, and if customers embrace the new way, what's gonna happen is incumbents who are practicing the older way are not gonna like you. And they're going to be self-interested critics. And so you do need, as you're looking yourself in the mirror, to try and tease those two things apart. Rule number 36, be effective. We try to uh, uh, create teams that are no larger than can be fed with two pizzas. We call that the two pizza team rule. Um, no PowerPoints are used inside of Amazon. Uh, so every meeting, we have, when we hire a new executive from the outside, <laughs> this is the weirdest meeting culture you will ever encounter and new executives have a little bit of, you know, culture shock in their first Amazon meeting because what we do is somebody for the meeting has prepared a six page memo, a narratively structured memo that is got, you know, real sentences and topic sentences and verbs and nouns, not just bullet points. And it lays out and supposed to create the context for what will then be a good discussion. So, and then we read those memos silently in the meeting. So it's like a study hall. And we do that, everybody sits around the table and we read silently for usually about half an hour, however long it takes us to read the document. And then we discuss it. And it's so much better than the typical PowerPoint presentation for so many reasons. I definitely recommend the memo over the PowerPoint and the reason we read them in the room, by the way, is because just like, you know, high school kids, executives will bluff their way through the meeting as if they've read the memo. <laughs> because we're busy and so uh, you gotta actually carve out the time for the memo to get read. And that's what the first half hour of the meeting is for. And then everybody's actually read the memo. They're not just pretending to have read the memo. <laughs> Rule number 37, follow your intuition. I believe in the power of wandering. All of my best decisions in business and in life have been made with heart, 
intuition, guts, uh, you know, uh, not, not uh, anal- analysis. Um, when you can make a decision with analysis, you should do so. But it turns out in life that your most important decisions are always made with instinct, intuition, taste, heart. Rule number 38, act on your great ideas. I picked books because there were more items in the book category than any other category. And so you could build universal selection. There were three million in 1994 when I was pulling this idea together. The, the, the three million different books active and in print at any given time. And the largest physical bookstores only had about 150,000 different titles. And so I could see how you could make a bookstore online with universal selection. Every book ever printed, even the out of print ones, was the original vision for the company. And so that's why books. And when did you know that Amazon is going to be, some, going to be something I, way bigger than just a bookstore? Well, I knew that the books, strangely, because I was very prepared for this to take a really long time. I knew mm-hmm. that the books um, business was going to be successful in the first 30 days. Mm-hmm. I was shocked at how many books we sold. We were ill prepared. Um, you know, I had, we had all the We had only 10 people in the company at that time, and most of them were software engineers. Mm-hmm. And so everybody, including me and the software, were all like packing boxes. We didn't even have packing tables. And down, we were on our hands and knees on a concrete floor packing the boxes. And at about you know, one or two in the morning, I said to one of my uh, software engineering colleagues, I said, um, you know, Paul, um, we, uh, this is killing my knees. We need to get knee pads. And Paul looked at me and he's like, Jeff, we need to get packing tables. <laughs> and and I, I was like, oh my God, that is such a good idea. The next day I bought packing tables and it doubled our productivity and probably saved our backs and our knees too. Rule number 39, be a visionary. My greatest, uh, 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 I would have such a good feeling if I could be an 80 year old guy and lay in there thinking about my life if I could say, look, there is um, now a bunch of entrepreneurs in space because I took my Amazon lottery winnings and built the heavy lifting infrastructure that does take billions of dollars in CapEx to lower the cost of access to space. That's how you get millions of people living and working. And by the way, we need that. For those of you who like to think about the future at all, um, you can do a simple calculation. You know, we, we can argue about um, you know, what limited resources on Earth and so on and so on, but here's a calculation that you cannot argue with, which is you take current baseline energy usage on Earth, compound it at just a few percent a year for just a few hundred years, and you have to cover the entire surface of the Earth in solar cells. So you have to, we're going to have to decide, do we want a society of pioneering, invention, expansion, growth, or do we want a society of stasis? And personally, I believe, because the Earth is finite, and if you want a society of stasis, I think it's gonna, first of all, I don't personally believe that stasis is even compatible with freedom, so I think for me that's a big problem. Second of all, it's gonna be dull. Stasis is gonna be very dull. You don't want to live in the stasis world. And so, of course, we're going to continue to get more efficient, too. We have been. For hundreds of years, we've been getting more productive, more efficient. That's, that trend is going to continue. Um, but even so, we're going to want to use more energy, more energy per capita. And also, I don't want to stabilize population. I would love for there to be a trillion humans in the solar system. With a trillion humans, we would have a thousand Einsteins and a thousand Mozarts. It'd be an incredible civil. Don't you want that dynamism? It'd be so much more interesting. My, this is for your great, great, great grandchildren, but what kind of world do you want them to live in? I, I want them to live in that expansive world that is you know, uh, learning more about the universe and moving out throughout the solar system. Rule number 40, be willing to be misunderstood. If you're gonna do anything new or innovative, you have to be willing to be misunderstood. And if you can't tolerate that, then for God's sake, don't do anything new or innovative. Um, Every important thing we've done has been misunderstood, um, often by well-meaning, sincere critics, sometimes, of course, by self-interested, insincere critics. Rule number 41, act on your ideas. I came across the fact, um, so this is 1994, 
Nobody has heard of the internet, very, very few people. And I came across the fact that the web, World Wide Web, was growing at something like 2,300% a year. This is in 1994, and anything growing that fast is, even if its baseline usage today is tiny, it's growing so fast, it's gonna be big. And so I looked at that and I was like, there's gotta be, I should come up with a business idea and the, you know, on the internet and then let the internet grow around this and we can keep working on it. And so I made a list of products that I might sell online and I started force ranking them. And I picked books because books is super unusual in one respect, which is that there are more book items in the book category than there are items in any other category. There are three million different books active and in print around the world at any given time. So my, my, the founding idea of Amazon was to build universal selection of books. The biggest bookstores only had 150,000 titles. And so that's what I did. And, and, and I, you know, I hired a small team and we built, we built the software. I moved to Seattle. I mean, you told your parents you were going to quit D.E. Shaw where you were successful, making presumably a fair amount of money. Yeah. And you told your wife, Mackenzie, that you're yeah. going to move across the country. What did they all say? They were immediately and reflexively supportive right after they asked the question, what's the internet? Rule number 42, delight the customers. We haven't had any existential crises, knock on wood. I, find, I don't want to jinx anything. Um, but we've had a lot of uh, kind of dramatic events. I remember um, there, early on, we only had 125 employees when Barnes & Noble, who, the big U United States bookseller, um, opened their online website to compete against us, barnesandnoble.com. We'd had about a two-year window. We opened in 95, they opened in 97. And at that time, all of the headlines, and the funniest were about how we were about to be destroyed by this much larger company. We had 125 employees and $60 million a year in annual sales, 60 million with an M. And that, uh, and Barnes and Noble at the time had 30,000 employees and about $3 billion in sales. So it, they were giant, we were tiny, and we had limited resources. And the, the headlines were um, very negative about Amazon. And the, the one that's most memor memorable was just Amazon.toast. And, um, <laughs> and so I called an all hands meeting, which was not hard to do with just 125 people. And we got in a room and, because it was so um, scary for all of us, this idea that now we finally had a big competitor, that literally everybody's parents were calling and saying, you know, are you okay? Is the, you know, it's usually the moms um, calling and asking their children, are you gonna be okay? So, and I said, look, you know, it, it's okay to be afraid, um, but don't be afraid of our competitors because they're never gonna send us any money. Be afraid of our customers. And if we just stay focused on them, and, 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 and instead of obsessing over this big competitor that we just got, that we'll be fine. Um, and I really do believe that. I think that if you stay focused, then the more uh, drama there is and everything else, no matter what the drama is, whatever the external distraction is, the, the, what your, your response to it should be to double down on the customer, satisfying them, not just satisfying them, delighting them. Rule number 43, follow your calling. You don't choose your passions, your passions choose you. And all of us are gifted with certain passions and the people who are lucky are the ones who get to follow those things. And I always advise our uh, young employees, I meet with interns and so on, you can have, and my kids too, you can have a job or you can have a career or you can have a calling. And if you can somehow figure out how to have a calling, you have hit the jackpot because that's the big deal. Rule number 44, grow your vision. What propelled you to sell things more than books? Uh, after books, we started selling music, and then we started selling um, videos, and then I got smart, and I, um, I emailed a, a, a thousand randomly selected customers and asked them, besides the things we sell today, what would you like to see us sell? And that answer came back incredibly long-tailed. The way they answered the question was with whatever they were looking for at that moment. So like I remember one of the answers was, I wish you sold windshield wiper blades because I really need windshield wiper blades. <laughs> and I thought to myself, we can sell anything this way. And, um, and then so then we launched uh, electronics and toys and many other categories over time. 
and the, the vision became, because you read the original business plan, it's just books. Rule number 45, have good role models. We all get um, gifts. Uh, we get certain things in our life that, are, um, uh, that we're very lucky about. And one of the most powerful one is who your early role models are. You know, you could, they could it be your parents. It was your grand grandfather. It was yeah. in a big sense. My, my mom and dad, but my mm. grandfather too. And you know, I had my mom had me when she was uh, 17 years old, and she was still in high school in Albuquerque, New Mexico. And this is in 1964. I can assure you that being a pregnant uh, teenager in high school was not cool in Albuquerque, New Mexico at that time. And uh, so uh, it's in, in, so it was a very, it was difficult for her. My grandfather went to bat for her when they tried to kick her out of school. And you know, he, they're, they're incredible. I had, to, so the gift I had is I had this incredible family. Rule number 46, maintain a day one culture. Now that you have about 600,000 employees, I calculated you're adding about 250 people a day. Um, you've mentioned that you're trying to fend off day two. Yeah. And you've said that day two is stasis, followed by irrelevance, followed by excruciatingly painful decline, followed by death. That yeah. is why it is always day one. Yeah. I, so I, yeah. How's that work? Well, so day one, um, this is a phrase that we use at Amazon all the time. I've been using it since my first annual shareholder letter from 20 years ago. Um, and we say it's always day one. And it needs to be day one for the reason that you just mentioned. Um, and how do you, so the real question for me is how do you go about maintaining a day one culture? You know, it's great to have the, um, the scale of Amazon. We have financial resources. We have lots of brilliant people. We can accomplish great things. We have global scope. We have operations all over the world. But the downside of that is that you can lose your nimbleness. You can lose your entrepreneurial spirit. You can lose your, that kind of heart that, the, the, that, um, that small companies often have. And so if you could have the best of both worlds, if you can have that entrepreneurial spirit and heart, while at the same time having all the advantages that come with scale and scope, I think Think of the things that you could do. And, and so how, the question is, how do you achieve that? Um, the, the scale is good because it makes you robust. You know, a, a, a big boxer can take a punch to the head. The question is, you also want to dodge those punches. So you'd like to be nimble. You want to be big and nimble. And I find that there are a lot of things that are protective of the day one mentality. I already spent some time on one of them, which is customer obsession. I think that's the most important thing. If you can, and it gets harder as you get bigger. When you're a little tiny company, say you're a 10 person startup company, every single person in the company is focused on the customer. When you get to be a bigger company, you've got all the middle, you've got middle managers and you've got all these layers and the, those people aren't on the front lines. They're not interacting with customers every day. They're insulated from customers. And they start to manage not the customer uh, happiness directly, but they start to manage through proxies like metrics and processes. And some of those things can become bureaucratic. So it's very challenging. But one of the things that happens is the decision-making velocity slows down. And I think the reason, one of the reasons that that happens is that people, all say junior executives inside the big company, start to... Uh, model all decisions as if they are heavyweight, irreversible, highly consequential decisions. And so even two-way doors, you could make, you make a decision, it's the wrong decision, you can just back up, back through the door and try again. Even those reversible decisions start to be made with heavyweight processes. And so you can teach people that these pitfalls and, and, and traps and then teach them to avoid those traps. And that's what we're trying to do at Amazon so that we can maintain our inventiveness and our heart and our kind of small company spirit even as we have the scale and scope of a larger company. Rule number 47, be a good leader. I'm actually a big fan of anecdotes in business, not building a narrative structure around them necessarily, but I still have... Uh, an email address that customers can write to. I see most of those emails, and I don't answer very many of them anymore. But, but I see them, and I and I forward them. Uh, some of them, the ones that catch my curiosity, 
I forward them to the executives in charge of that area with, with a question mark. And that question mark is just a shorthand for, can you look into this? Why is this happening? What does it, what's going on? And what I find is very interesting, because we have tons of metrics. We have you know, weekly business reviews with these metric decks, and we look at our, we know so many things about customers and their, uh, their you know, whether we're delivering on time, uh, what, you know, whether the uh, packages have too much air in them and, you know, wasteful of packaging and so on. We have so many metrics that we monitor. And the thing I have noticed is that when the anecdotes and the data disagree, the anecdotes are usually right. There's something wrong with the way you're measuring it. And that's why it's so important to to keep your, you need the, to run something that you, where you're doing, you know, uh, shipping billions of packages a year. For sure, you need good data and metrics. Are you delivering on time? Are you delivering on time in every city? Are you delivering on time to apartment complexes? Are you delivering on time in certain countries? You do need the data. But then you need to check that data with your intuition and your instincts. And you need to teach that to the, all the senior executives uh, and, and junior executives, too. Rule number 48, never be satisfied. The great thing about uh, humans in general is we're always improving things. And so entrepreneurs um, uh, and inventors, uh, and you know, they follow their curiosity and they follow their passions and they figure something out and then they figure out how to make it better and they're never satisfied. Uh, and, and you need to harness that, in my view, you need to harness that energy uh, primarily on your customers instead of on your competitors. And so where I see, I sometimes see companies and even young small startup companies, entrepreneurs go awry, is they start to pay more attention to their competition than they do to their customers. And I think that that, um, I think that in big mature industries, that can be, that might be, a winning approach in some cases, kind of close following. Let other people be the pioneers and, you know, uh, and, and go down the blind alleys. Mm. There's many things that, that, that a new inventive company tries won't work. Um, and so those mistakes and errors and failures do cost real money. Um, and, and, and so maybe in a mature industry where growth rates are slow and change is very slow. But as you see in the world more and more, there aren't very many Mature industries, change is happening everywhere. You know, we see it in the automobile industry with self-driving cars, and but you could go right down the line of every industry and you would see it. Rule number 49, make it happen. Was there a moment you thought, I might not make it? The riskiest moment for Amazon, Charlie, was uh, at the very, very beginning. I needed to raise a million dollars at a certain point. And I uh, ended up giving away 20% of the company for a million dollars. a hell of a deal for somebody. A lot of people did very well on that deal. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, they, but they also took a risk, so they deserved to do very well on that deal. But I, um, I had to take 60 meetings to raise a million dollars, and I raised it from 22 people at approximately $50,000 a person. And it was nip and tuck whether I was going to be able to raise that money. So the whole thing could have ended before it even started. That was 1995, you know, and the first question every investor asked me was, what's the internet? And rule number 50, the last one before a very special bonus clip is laugh. I loved high school. I had so much fun. We had, um, I, got, I lost my library privileges because I laughed too loudly in the library. <laughs> And, what about uh, that laugh? Where did you get that laugh from? You know, it is distinctive. I've had that laugh all my life. There was a short, not that short, there was a multi-year period where my brother and sister would not see a movie with me because they thought it was too embarrassing. Um, and my, uh, but I don't know why I have this laugh. It's just, it's just, and I laugh easily and often. Um, the people who know me, you know, you ask my mom or uh, anybody who knows me well, and they'll say, if Jeff's unhappy, wait five minutes. Now I have a special bonus clip from Jeff on how to be focused that I think you're gonna enjoy. But before that, it's time for the three point landing questions. Let's go from just watching a video to taking action. Here we go. Question number one, what is your intuition telling you to do? Number two, what does choosing a life of adventure mean to you? And number three, who are two role models that you're gonna study and learn from? And if you like this video and you're gonna take immediate action, give me a hashtag believe down in the comments as well. I've always been 
uh, focused. When I was in Montessori school, um, the uh, Montessori school teacher told my mom that I wouldn't switch tasks. And, um, they, and they, they got me to switch tasks by picking me up, including my chair, and just moving me to the new task station. Um, I've gotten a little better about that uh, over the years, but it's still, task switching is still a problem for me. If you wanna learn more about Jeff and Amazon's journey, check out the video right there next to me. I think you'll enjoy it. Continue to believe, and I'll see you there. The web usage in the spring of 1994 was growing at 2,300% a year. You know, things just don't grow that fast. It's highly unusual.